I've always liked the idea of using a whole collection of different stoneware clay bodies in combination with a limited palette of glazes. The clay underneath makes such a difference on the final outcome of the glaze, and by relying on these clays to be what changes the glazes visually once fired, I don't end up working in a studio that's completely full of different buckets. Rather, I just change the clay I'm using for subtle differences, both in colour and texture. Speaking of texture, on the left is my normal clay body, whilst on the right is one of eight different stonewares I'm going to be testing. And this specific one from Pot Clays is called Grogged Pink. It's incredibly coarse and is meant for hand building, I think, but it can be mixed down with smoother clays to create something that's a bit more workable, but I'm going to be throwing it as is. All of these bowls will be thrown on wooden bats, like so, and to attach these down I first dampen the underside, tap centre them onto the bat, and then press down whilst rubbing it back and forth. This way, after the pots have been thrown, I can simply lift away the bat with the pot on top of it, which will hopefully lead to less distortion in the piece, and that's helpful as I'm working with clays I'm not familiar with. You can really feel this stuff grind against your hands but the centering is the worst part of the process. And once the lump of clay has been opened up and the base formed, the walls are easy to lift up. Although, even after throwing two or three bowls with this clay, my hands were quite red and raw, so think of it a bit like throwing with sandpaper. From the description, this clay fires to a rich purple-brown colour, and I can't wait to see how it looks with the glaze on top of it. And I'll be showing all the results, of course, towards the end of this video. With the internal base shaped, I can begin to pull the walls up, a process that went slowly initially, as I found if I dug my knuckle in too firmly, the coarse particles would really dig into my skin, and also the slip that coats the pot, lubricating it so it can be thrown, would almost immediately be scraped off, making it very hard to pull without the clay just sticking to my hand. But it felt like the more I pulled it up, and the thinner the walls got, the easier the clay became to work. And whilst you might not be able to see just how groggy the clay is at this stage, just wait for the trimming which I'll show after the bowl has been thrown. The other advantage with working with a whole variety of stonewares that fire roughly to the same temperature is that I don't have to worry about contamination very much. If the scraps that come off all mix together, then I'll simply mix them all up and wedge them thoroughly creating a body that's different from all the others, although if I then blend this back with my normal stoneware body, I'm sure you'd barely be able to notice any contamination at all. All the bowls I'll be making will have different shapes and will be thrown to different sizes, as ultimately, these pots, which were tests, if they fired successfully, were destined for my exhibition at YSP, which is still on and runs until the 25th of February, and I'll leave a link in the description with more information about that. With the outside shape formed, and most of the slip scraped off, I can move on to finishing the pot up in preparation for removing it from the wheel. This begins by scraping away excess clay from around the base. I want this bowl to have a tall foot, but I don't want it to splay out so much. It's easy to shape at this stage, you just need to be careful to not let too much material build up on the tool, which then might press up into the walls above it, distorting the shape of the bowl. I then sponge out any excess water and slip, and then use a relatively soft plastic kidney with a sharp edge to scrape clean the interior form, and to create this step, you can see just underneath the rim. The bat can then be pried off, and the bowl will be set aside with the others to slowly turn leather hard overnight, whereupon they will be trimmed. The following day, and the clay is now firm enough to turn, although there's a slight undulation in the rim I need to deal with. Often, this can be fixed, just by flipping the bowl upside down and trimming the bottom flat. You can see that the base wavers up and down slightly, and it's this irregularity that often causes the rim to move like it does. So it's trimmed flat, and it's also worth noting quickly that whenever I turn these coarse bodies, I never use my tungsten carbide trimming tools, as their blades will easily be chipped and damaged by the coarse particles. The bowl is then slipped onto the wheel head, tap centred, and then the base is sealed in with a plastic kidney. The undulation isn't gone completely, but it's definitely better than it was, and I spend this moment tidying up the inside and turning this ledge, and it's at this stage that you can really hear the grit grinding against the metal, and textured clay like this will wear out these metal turning tools really quickly. 
Coarse specks of grog are often ground up fired ceramic that's added back to the clay, and I'm sure you all know how abrasive ceramic is. I use a soft piece of clay to pick up the smaller burrs of clay left inside the bowl, and then I switch back to the plastic kidney just to burnish over any particularly prickly area, compressing the sharp particulates back into the body. With the insides and rim turned, the bowl is separated from the wheel, the wheel head is cleaned, and then the bowl is flipped over. Once spinning centrally, the bowl is secured in place with three lumps of soft clay, and then the foot and outer walls of this pot can be trimmed. This stoneware definitely feels different to trim. It comes off in shorter ribbons, and it feels like it has a bit more of an influence on the movement of your tools. So I felt like I needed to grip them a bit more firmly, which you can see in the way I'm holding the tool, my fingers pressed on the blade to give me the utmost control. The fingers of my left hand are also pushing down to help keep the bowl pinned against the wheel, as there's always a chance the pot will want to leap up, or one of the securing lugs of clay will come loose and the bowl will veer off to one side. So by pinning it down, not only do I help prevent this from happening, but that left hand as it's touching the pot will sense any change in motion, meaning you'll preemptively feel it before it comes loose and you can correct it. And if it does come loose, that left hand is ready to catch the pot before it skids off to one side and breaks. With the outside walls and foot trimmed, I can now begin hollowing out the base. And from this angle, you can really see how gritty this clay is. From the eight stonewares I tested, there was only one other that was this rough, but it has a much lighter color, so I doubt my glazes will react as interestingly over it. With the foot ring trimmed, I then burnish the part that will actually make contact with the table, as otherwise this pot would scratch any wooden surface it's placed and dragged on. The smoother surface also means my maker's mark will appear more clearly. And that's one of the bowls finished. Although the sharp rim needed just one last bit of burnishing. And next, I can move on to trimming all the other bowls thrown with different clay bodies, which I won't show in quite so much detail, other than talking about each clay's characteristics. This first one is the same one you've just seen me throw and trim, only the bowl has a different shape. The next piece was thrown with the David Wright hand building body, which is very coarse, heavily iron bearing, and can withstand temperatures up to 1300 degrees Celsius. In terms of workability, it was almost identical to the grogged pink, but with the advantage that it doesn't stain everything it touches. The previous body contains quite a lot of terracotta, which generally makes for a clay that's a bit messier to work with, whereas this body is just made from ball clay, fire clay, and a mixture of grog and sand to give it tooth and texture. With these textured clays, I'm hoping that much of the coarse, gritty surface remains even once covered in glaze, and in retrospect, and when I next use this clay, I won't burnish it nearly so much, as doing so gets rid of much of the character the clay body has. The next two clays were very similar, throwing and trimming beautifully, with just enough grog so they don't feel like plastic to trim. I prefer when there's some tooth to the body, as it provides some haptic feedback and leaves a slightly textured surface wherever the clay is left bare on the pot, which I always like in contrast with the smoother glazes. This particular body is the flecked stoneware, and although it isn't very obvious, this clay is covered in black spots that show even an oxidation, giving the impression that the pot has in fact been reduction fired. 
you can see the black flecks more clearly here, now that the surface has been shaved back. This next pot was thrown with clay that was buttery smooth. It's called Staffordshire Stoneware, and it's very plastic and easy to throw with, and it contains enough red moulds to give the body its iron speck. And here's what's simply called their stoneware body. It's slightly textured and is made for both reduction and oxidised firings, and was all round just a pleasant body to work with, and very similar in many ways to the ES80 I normally use. And lastly, the premium buff, made with local fire clay that again speckles at stoneware temperatures. Whilst the colour of all the clays are very different at this stage, once fired they're all going to change a lot. And in most cases, sadly, I don't think they'll be as interesting as they appear now. Sometimes I wish the pots could keep the lovely sheen and colour they have at this point. But inevitably, once fired, they always dull down and turn a bit more grey and brown. All of these bowls are then placed into my electric kiln for a bisque firing to 1000 degrees Celsius, which is programmed and set to fire by itself overnight. About 36 hours later, and the kiln is now cool enough to unpack, and you can clearly see just how much the colours of these clays change. After this firing to 1000 degrees Celsius, the clay has changed into ceramic. The particles have begun to fuse, vitrifying, but not all the way yet, meaning at this stage the clay is much stronger and harder, but also porous, which is a necessary trait for the glazing process. As when these pots are dipped into buckets of glaze, the water is absorbed into the bodies, leaving a layer of the raw materials on the outside. Next, as always, a layer of wax is brushed over the foot ring. This way, when the pot is dipped into the bucket of glaze, it won't adhere to the bottom. I'm using a simple wax emulsion from Scarva Pottery Suppliers. It does the job well, and I've watered it down slightly, which helps it brush on a bit more smoothly. But after waxing all of these, what makes the biggest difference, really, is the texture of the clay. With all the bowls waxed, I'll now be glazing them in either my white, pale green or dark green crackle glaze. And here's perhaps the best tip I was ever taught on how to keep the workplace clean and tidy when you're glazing, and it's to simply keep all your glazing tools on the underside of the lid, rather than placing them on the wearboard or workbench, or anywhere else that might need tidying up later on. If they go on the underside of the bucket, then you don't need to clean anything up, apart from the tools themselves. This is the grogged pink clay body, and for one of the two bowls I made with this body, I wanted to leave the outside raw, so that the clay body could really shine and show its character. So I poured the white in, swirled it around, and then dumped the glaze out. I'll have to clean up the glaze where it overflowed onto the exterior shape, and hopefully it isn't too difficult to dig the glaze out of the scratches left by the grog. For the pieces I want to be glazed entirely, I hold them firmly with a pair of tongs, submerge them, and then slowly draw them out. Another difference I noticed when glazing all of these is how the glaze they were thrown with affects how the glaze settles on them. Some of the stonewares will be more open than others, meaning they're more absorbent, whilst others will be more sealed, less absorbent, and the glaze coated over them will take longer to dry, resulting potentially in a less even surface, which means there's a knack for each for getting it right. The other thing to notice is just how cleanly the glaze flows off the bodies that are smoother, on the waxed portions. Whereas with this body, which is particularly coarse, the glaze really clings to the wax, which means I'll have to spend much more time tidying the pot up 
later before it can be packed into the gas kiln and reduction fired. Another issue with the very coarse clays is that the glaze settles in a very uneven, cratered surface. I tried blowing on these as they dried to see if it makes any difference or dry with a smoother finish, but it didn't do very much. Here's one of the particularly smooth clay bodies and you can see just how cleanly the glaze flows off the wax. The following day, now that the glaze has dried, I'll spend some time cleaning up each bowl. This is much easier to do once all the moisture has left the pot. These glazes become more powdery and soft, and they're easier to remove with a knife, my finger, and a wet sponge, which are generally the only three tools I use for this, with my aim being to create a very crisp line of glaze all around the rim. I then use my thumb or a finger to fettle away any raised bumps or drips of glaze. And it was tricky with this highly textured body to get rid of all the white specks lodged in some of the deeper crevices in the surface. whereas pieces made with a very smooth clay body were far easier to clean up. The most important part of this is to make sure there are no specks of glaze left on the base, as one drip alone could be enough to stick the pot to the kiln shelf and ruins what's otherwise a perfectly cleaned base. Prior to beginning this cleaning up process, I first thoroughly wiped down and cleaned the area I'm working in. This way, once I've finished cleaning up all the white pots, I can simply scrape any leftover glaze dust back into this basin of water, all of which I'll eventually sieve back into my larger buckets of glaze. And it's also for a similar reason that I always begin by cleaning the white pots, as the white simply can't contaminate the pale green or the dark green, as they all share the same base recipe. But the pale green glaze and the dark green glaze can contaminate the white as they contain red iron oxide that the white doesn't. Like this pot, one of the cratered pieces on the grogged pink, which I fettled within an inch of its life to cover up and fill all those bubbles of glaze. I'm not sure if doing this actually makes any difference or whether they'd all just melt and fuse over during the firing, but doing this just felt right. But I tried my best not to remove too much as I didn't want to make the layer of glaze too thin. And here's the messy waxed foot covered in glaze that has to be removed. I tried to tap the excess glaze away into the basin and pulled the foam out on which the bowl was resting previously. The idea here is simple though, really. The cleaner the surface of glaze is at this point, the better it's going to look once fired. So I really take my time getting it right, even if it takes me all day. Coating the pots in glaze is quick in comparison, and instead it's cleaning up the surfaces and sponging their feet, which takes lots of time. With all of this work finally cleaned up, I can begin the process of packing the gas kiln and reduction firing. The pots are packed in as densely as possible, but they absolutely cannot touch, otherwise the glaze will melt and fuse together and a lot of care is taken to not get pink fingerprints on the white pots, but those are the only rules really. I try to keep the pots with the thinner walls away from the edges, this way they don't come into direct contact with the brunt of the flame, as this can otherwise cause them to warp, especially pots with handles, as the irregular weight distribution causes the side with the handle to pull out, causing the circular rim to turn into an oval. The following morning at 7am the kiln is lit. From beginning to end, this gas firing will take about eight hours, and throughout this process, the temperature is gradually risen. The door is sealed tight after the kiln has been lit, and then the gas pressure is slowly increased until 860 degrees exactly, whereupon the reduction atmosphere is initiated. I'm going to skip over this process a lot in this video, but if you'd like to find out more about it, I'll include a link on screen now and in the description below that goes into reduction firing in a lot more detail.
For now though, to put it simply, this process of reduction firing causes the clay and glazes to do things that you can't quite achieve in an oxidized firing, especially in terms of color and achieving a natural iron fleck on the body. And at last, many long, loud hours later, once the kiln reaches approximately 1,300 degrees Celsius, the gas is switched off and the kiln is allowed to cool for a number of days, whereupon the kiln can be cracked open and all the hard work finally seen and held. So far, they've all fired successfully, and this bowl looked promising in the back. Crack. Until I picked it up and something just felt off. The pot cracking in half without me even trying. At least it didn't crack into too many pieces and it shows a perfect cross section. Surprisingly, the glaze isn't as thick as I imagined, which is what I thought might cause it to split like this. But really, I think it's an issue caused by only glazing the inside. As snowflake crackle glazes like this are notorious for shrinking a lot and contracting more than the stoneware body underneath it. And I think in this case, that literally tore the pot in half. Here's that grogged pink bowl I started with, amongst many others. And now, the final step before they're actually finished is to sand the bottom of each pot to remove the coarse specks of grog that always appear, even if you've burnished the clay, because as the clay fires, it shrinks more than the particles of grog which have already been fired, which means even if you spent time at the leather hard stage burnishing the clay to be glassy smooth, once fired, that smooth quality is going to be lost to some degree and it will need to be sanded, albeit only gently at this stage. I say gently, as if I were to grind away too much from the bottoms of these, I'd remove much of the character and color given to the pots via the reduction firing process. So I only ever sand away what's necessary. And here's the finished date. And from this far away, the differences aren't huge. The greens are perhaps slightly more blue in some cases, and the rims of the pots have broken to different colors to reflect the tone of the clay underneath. But perhaps the biggest difference is the way the crackles of this crackle glaze have formed. The grogged pink isn't pink whatsoever, but it has a lovely icy tone to it. Here, the crackles feel more systematic, the scales larger, or they have less character, this is the David Wright hand-building body, which is pale and covered in iron speckles. In some cases, the clay is more or less identical to that I was firing with previously, or it has more of a grey tone to it, a colder colour, which you can see in the glaze itself. This is fleck. Here's the grogged pink, which is full of life and interest, and feels surprisingly smooth too. I love the deep, dark, almost metallic feel of the clay. The David Wright, in comparison, isn't nearly so interesting, although it's done this strange thing where the clay is darker in the middle, as compared to the rest of the foot. This is one of the very smooth clay bodies, which I like in terms of how detailed the finish is, but the muddy tone of the clay makes the glaze feel a bit muddy too. Here's another bowl made with the David Wright hand-building body, which I like, but I do feel like it's missing some definition. And with this piece, the intentional crazing simply doesn't act like it normally should, and again feels just a bit flat and lifeless. But I think there's a few I might incorporate. This flecked body, which isn't the same one you may have seen me use previously in an older video, is actually rather nice, and I like how the flecks seem to have happened arbitrarily, almost like a constellation. It's really interesting to see how the glaze breaks on different sharp edges. With this piece, the rim has turned into a lovely metallic band. Whereas on this piece, it's a lighter color, which is more subtle and quiet. And here's the grogged pink. I really like where the glaze breaks on the sharp edges and where the glaze is applied thickly enough, but it does have somewhat of a patchy quality to it. And it just doesn't feel as refined and careful as the rest of my work. And I think there are just too many specs for my liking too. 
and I much prefer this David Wright bowl. The glaze feels more intentional and the iron specks fewer, which makes them more special, especially as they seem to bleed through in larger blots. Either way, do let me know what you think, and if you have a favourite, I'd love to hear which it is. In a moment, I'll include some higher resolution images, which should do a much better job of showing you what they're actually like. And with that, thank you so much for taking your time to watch, and I'll see you next time.